All right, we're gonna get started as long as everyone can hear me. I'm gonna assume so. All right, my name is Car Caroline Hale and I'm a licensed clinical social worker associate and I work here at Legal Aid of North Carolina on the Disaster Relief Project. In my role here, I connect clients, I connect with clients to support their emotional needs and overall well-being so that they can best engage in the legal process. Thank you so much for joining me tonight and I hope you find this information helpful. If you have any questions throughout this presentation, you can send them in the chat box if you're viewing this through Zoom or you can comment on the post if you're viewing through Facebook. So in this presentation, I'm going to be discussing how the current COVID-19 crisis may be affecting your mental health. The current crisis has changed how we interact, how we work, and how we live. I will discuss the feelings and emotions that many of us will be having are having right now and when to seek outside help and how to seek outside help. And also I'll, I'll share some ways to cope with these overwhelming emotions that we may be experiencing. I'm gonna start by describing some of the signs and symptoms of anxiety, depression, and trauma so that you can best identify whether this is something that you or one of your loved ones is experiencing during this time. These are common conditions that you may experience during times of stress. Times of stress may also be tough for people experiencing more serious mental health conditions, especially people who are managing well in a routine or schedule that has been disrupted. So keep in mind that all of the things I'm gonna list are things that we experience sometimes. It's normal to experience some of these things some of the time. But if you're experiencing these symptoms most of the time, that may be a sign you should reach out, reach out for help. Um, to meet the diagnosis criteria for many of these conditions, you must be experiencing these symptoms for a prolonged period of time. Um, ju and just because you're experiencing some of these symptoms does not necessarily mean that you are experiencing anxiety or depression at a clinical level. Um, sometimes we just feel depressed feelings without actually being depressed. This is a really strange time and we are all trying to adjust. So I'm going to start uh, describing some of the signs and symptoms. Um, mental health challenges manifest both emotionally and physically. I'm going to give some examples of symptoms that you may recognize right now. So to start off, we're going to begin with anxiety. Um, you know, sometimes we just feel a general sense of anxiety and it can be hard to put to words what exactly we're feeling. Um, so some signs that you may be experiencing anxiety are um, restlessness or kind of just a feeling of being on edge. That may look like sitting down to do something and feeling like you need to immediately move on to the next task. Um, you may be feel easily fatigued. You may be worn out sooner or more often than usual. Um, we're all kind of cooped up in our houses and aren't as busy as we usually are, and that can also cause some fatigue. You may have difficulty concentrating or experiencing your mind going blank or kind of just zoning out. Um, you may be thinking about other things while someone's trying to talk to you or walk in a room and forget why you were there. You may feel some irritability, which may or may not be observable by others. Um, we're spending a lot of time with the same people if we're isolated with someone, and you may be noticing things about them that you didn't, bef didn't before. Um, and again, experiencing any of these things some of the time is normal, but if it's interfering with your daily life and some of the responsibilities you have, that may be a sign it's something more serious. Um, and like I said before, you may experience some physical symptoms of anxiety. Those can include muscle tension. Um, cleansing your jaw is really common uh, when you're awake and when you're asleep. You may have your shoulders kind of um, tensed up. Um, you may experience psychomotor agitation, which is like tapping your fingers, um, shaking your leg or foot when you're sitting, um, any kind of repetitive motion that you may not notice you're doing. Um, I'm pretty bad about shaking my leg and I usually don't realize I'm doing it until someone tells me to stop. Um, nausea is another physical symptom you may experience. Uh, believe it or not, your gut is a stress organ. Um, this also shows up a lot in children when they have anxiety um, since they can't always verbalize how they feel. You may experience sleep disturbance. Um, with anxiety, you may be sleeping less than normal or just not feeling like you're getting a restful sleep. Um, 
One of the more serious symptoms of anxiety is intrusive thoughts. An intrusive thought is an unwelcome involuntary thought or image or just an idea you can't get out of your head. Um, usually it's something that may be distressing or um, upsetting to you and you may have a fear that you might actually do the thing you're thinking of. Um, you may also experience panic attacks if your anxiety rises to that level. Um, a panic attack elicits a very physical reaction, such as a racing heartbeat, sweating, hot flashes or chills, racing thoughts, trouble breathing, a general feeling of loss of control, shaking, dizziness, a feeling of detachment, um, nausea. Um, panic attacks are very uncomfortable, but they are not dangerous to your physical health. Um, but if you uh, do not seek mental health treatment for panic attacks or find a coping mechanism, mechanism that works for you, they'll likely continue to happen. So again, we all experience these things some of the time, and sometimes we just have a general feeling of anxiety, especially right now. Um, and you've likely developed some coping skills on your own without really realizing it. So if you can kind of take a moment to think back to a time you felt anxious, um, what are some things you did to kind of manage that or, or make it go away at that time? Next, we're gonna go over some signs and symptoms of depression. Um, depression doesn't necessarily mean that you feel sad. It could be an absence of emotions, um, dulled emotions, or just a feeling of being foggy. Um, you may experience uh, diminished interest or loss of pleasures in activity um, you once found enjoyable. Uh, right now, we're really not able to do a lot of the things that we used to find enjoyable um, since we're having to stay home so much, um, but that could even look like sitting down to watch your favorite TV show and not finding it very engaging. You may experience weight change or a change in your appetite. Um, you may be eating more. Um, if you're also experiencing anxiety, you may be eating less. Um, and it may also be seem overwhelming to even think about putting together a meal for yourself. Um, it's important to note that if you're eating more than normal, um, we often look to food to for comfort in a time of stress. So if you've gained a little weight, if you've lost a little weight, it's probably not something to be worried about. But if you've gained or lost a significant amount of weight, that's certainly a red flag. Um, next, like anxiety, you may experience um, sleep disturbance. It, with depression, that usually looks like having unsettling dreams, having difficulty falling asleep, staying in sleep. Um, you may also be sleeping a lot more than you usually do or you may find yourself um, having a hard time getting out of bed and just kind of laying in bed for most of the day. Um, you may experience psychomotor agitation, um, or not psychomotor ag agitation, um, that's for anxiety, psychomotor retardation, which means that you are experiencing delayed thoughts and emotional reactions. It may take longer for you to process information when someone's telling you something. Um, and you may also be talking or maybe just moving a little slower, zoning out. Um, fatigue and loss of energy is another sign. Um, this may look like needing to get out of bed to do something as simple as using the bathroom and just really feeling like you can't get up to do it. Um, going along those same lines, this may result in poor hygiene. Um, you may feel overwhelmed by the need to complete daily tasks such as showering, brushing your teeth, changing your clothes. Um, kind of a key feature of depression is feeling overwhelmed by tasks we do every day. Uh, you may feel a general sense of worthlessness, feeling like you should be doing something productive, but you can't or you don't know what that thing is. Um, feeling like no one cares about you, even if you do know that that's not true. Um, and another more serious sign of depression is reoccurrent thoughts of death. Um, now this is different than a fear of dying. That's something almost everyone experiences. What I'm talking about is a feeling of wanting to die or maybe even having an idea or plan of how you could do that. This is certainly a sign that you should seek help. And there are many crisis lines available 24 seven that you can call that we're gonna discuss in just a minute. Um, during this time, it's normal to feel de depressed. Um, events we were looking forward to have been canceled. We can't see our friends and family. We can't go to church. We're all adjusting to a new normal. So certainly give yourself some time to adjust and be kind to yourself when you're struggling. 
Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about trauma. Um, so right now we're all experiencing a collective trauma. Some of our lives have been disrupted more than others. You may have lost your job. You may have been furloughed or had your hours cut. Um, experiencing financial hardship is certainly a form of trauma. Some people at this point have even lost loved ones to this virus or maybe separated from family they're used to seeing very often. Um, so I'll just note real quick that symptoms of trauma can present days, weeks, months, or even years after this event. So this may be something to keep in mind for, you know, after the world returns to normal, we could still be seeing effects of this time we spent in isolation. So some signs of trauma are feeling withdrawn or disassociating. Um, disassociating is feeling disconnected from your immediate surroundings or feeling um, just a detachment from reality. Um, if you think you're experiencing this, think about what you're doing when it's happening. Um, like anxiety, you may be feeling on edge. You may be irritable. Um, you may have mood swings or emotional outbursts. This could look like exploding over something really small, um, but likely that's been building up and kind of just the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, you may have poor concentration, racing heart rate. You may even have panic attacks. Um, those are all signs and symptoms of um, someone who's experienced, experiencing trauma. Um, you may also experience secondary trauma, which is not necessarily a trauma that has happened to you directly, although we, I did mention that we're all experiencing a collective trauma, but um, hearing about terrible things on the news or hearing about something awful that's happened to someone you love, that can result in secondary trauma. Um, and some of the signs and symptoms are similar to trauma, but um, it does differentiate a little bit. Um, you may feel kind of numb or detached. Um, you may feel overwhelmed or even hopeless. You may have low energy, feel fatigued. Um, you may experience hypervigilance, hypervigilance um, which is an increased state of alertness. Um, ex you're extremely sensitive to your surroundings. You may be angry or feel cynicism about the world, um, sleeplessness, fear, guilt. You may be minimizing the effect it's having on you or the effect it had on the person it happened to. Um, you may also experience the physical ailments such as a headache, nausea, and the other things we've discussed. With all of these things, if you're experiencing any of these signs or symptoms, whether you have, um, are experiencing them to a clinical degree, you may be coping by doing something that may be a little self-destructive. So that would be things such as taking sedatives, avoiding the problem, being in denial, working too much to distract yourself, um, drinking more alcohol than usual, ignoring your feelings, um, self-injury or other risky behaviors. Um, usually when we're engaging in um, self-destructive behaviors, we know what we're doing isn't great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some coping mechanisms that are more healthy and productive and may be helpful to you. Um, it's really important to remember that um, if you wanna try these things and you try one thing and it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Um, certainly don't force yourself to do it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work and you can move on to the next thing. Um, so the first thing I um, would recommend you try and do is to try and keep a daily routine. I know that's really hard right now because our lives are not the same as they were. Um, but even no matter how small, um, no matter how small the goal to keep a routine is, it could just look like having your meals at the same time every day. Um, it's a really good goal to ground yourself in a sense of normalcy because what we are experiencing is certainly not normal. Um, this is really good if you're trying to work from home. It can be good to have a routine that you stick to every day. This is also really good for children who are used to being in school. Um, children really thrive in an environment where they know what comes next. Try to be proactive about your sleep hygiene. Sleep is incredibly important to your overall mental health and well-being, um, no matter what you're dealing with. If you aren't sleeping well, you know you're not going to feel great the next day. So try and go to sleep and wake up around the same time every day and try as hard as you can to get those eight hours. Um, so strategies for better sleep that um, I found helpful for me is to put away the phone and turn off the TV at least 30 minutes before I try to go to bed. 
Um, you can try some progressive muscle relaxation and visualization activities, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, and something else that helps me is just having a fan or a white noise machine in the room. Um, next, you could schedule a time to worry. So it can be really overwhelming to be constantly absorbing the news and um, new information. I know I was getting notifications on my phone every 30 minutes and not, that's really not good to feel a wave of stress every 30 minutes. So best to turn those off for at least some part of the day. Um, so if you wanna schedule a time, I would say no more than an hour um, where you allow yourself to worry and read the news, that could be really beneficial. Um, the news makes it seem like the situation's changing every minute, which is true to some extent, but checking in on the news once a day is certainly sufficient to stay up to date on the information. Um, uh, controversially, if um, that seems stupid to you and you think you need to be watching the news all the time, um, then certainly do that. Um, but I would encourage you to um, take a break from the news, maybe even 10 minutes if you can do it, um, so that you have a break and can think about something else for a little bit of time and um, distance yourself from that a little bit. Um, next, I find it really helpful to make specific goals for the day, no matter how small they are. Your goal can just be to get out of bed and get dressed. That's a really great goal. And by accomplishing the goal, you feel productive and like the day is a success. Um, and if you want to do a few different things, I like to write a list and cross things off as I go. Um, making a list always makes me feel like I've been productive. Next, you're going to want to make sure you're checking in on your friends and family. They're likely feeling the same way that you are, and you could share these tips with them if you think they would be helpful. Uh, next, we're going to get into some more um, kind of uh, coping techniques. Um, they may seem kind of obscure, but I'm going to try to give you concrete ways to practice them. So the first thing is deep breathing. Um, you know, that's a pretty standard line people tell you when you're feeling anxious is, oh, take a deep breath. Um, but doing that isn't always helpful, but I try to be really intentional about breathing when I'm thinking about doing it. And one way I found that is helpful to kind of be intentional about the breath and, um, take my mind off of other things is to think of a square and you don't have to close your eyes, but what you do is imagine a square and you breathe up as you draw the square up, you hold it, you breathe out, hold it, breathe in, hold it, breathe out, hold it. Um, that kind of gives your mind a distraction from whatever you're thinking about, just thinking of something as simple as a square. Um, it also helps you um, breathe out and in at the same time same amount of time. Um, and you can try progressive muscle relaxation, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it, I think it's best to help um, relax you before you sleep because it does work best if you're laying down. Um, and with that, you start at your toes. And what you do is you tense your toes for five to 10 seconds and then you release and really notice how that feels. And then you do the same with your ankles, your calves and your knees all the way up to I think you could even squeeze your eyes for a few seconds and let that go. Um, that can be a really good, great way to relax your body. Um, next, you can practice mindfulness. Again, one of those things that feels obscure when someone says it, um, but hopefully this is a concrete way you can practice it. Um, one simple thing you could do is um, when you're feeling overwhelmed, you could take a moment to name something that you can see, name something you can feel, name something you can smell, and say, name something you can hear. Um, that's a grounding technique. That's also really great for children who are feeling overwhelmed. Um, you could take a walk um, and maybe don't take it with the goal being exercise. Um, even though a walk is always exercise, you can maybe try walking a little slower than you normally do, noticing who and what's around you um, and really noticing how your foot feet feel on the ground. Um, that can be a way to practice mindfulness. Um, you can practice mindfulness when you're playing with your children. Try noticing how they pick up the toys, notice the questions they ask you, and notice how they ask you to play. Uh, you could try writing things down um, or journaling. Sometimes when we're feeling overwhelmed, we can get really in our heads and 
just taking that and putting it on paper can kind of be some sort of release. Um, so you could try writing down what is causing you stress, what is causing you to feel overwhelmed, um, what can you control about the situation, what can you not control, how are you coping with what you can't control, and how might you cope in the future to um, decrease the stress and worry you feel. So with all those coping mechanisms that you, that I mentioned, um, I hope you try them. And if you still are feeling like your symptoms um, aren't managed or those things just aren't enough, it may be um, a good idea for you to seek out the help of a mental health professional. So um, I'm gonna go through how you can get help from a mental health professional, um, whether you have Medicaid, private insurance, or you wanna call a crisis line, things like that. Um, mental health providers are licensed to provide psychotherapy. Um, professionals include licensed clinical social workers like myself, um, licensed professional counselors, uh, marriage and family therapists, psychiatric nurses, psychologists, and psychiatrists. Um, most mental health conditions can be treated with just psychotherapy. Many individuals do never, never um, have the need for medication. Um, but if your provider feels you may benefit from medication after they've met with you a few times, um, they may arrange for you to see a psychiatrist or another appropriate provider. All right, so if you have Medicaid and you live in North Carolina, you can contact your local managed care organization. You can find a list of those on the Department of Health and Human Services website. So what you do is you call their intake line. And if you need immediate assistance, they have mobile crisis units that are still responding even during the pandemic. Um, the response time is typically between, if you're in a bigger city, it's usually around 30 minutes. Um, and if you're in a rural area, it's probably closer to two hours. Um, and through that intake line, you can also set up just a regular appointment for next week um, or another, another day that's close by. Um, if you have private insurance, you can call your insurance provider for a list of professionals in your area that accept your insurance. Um, you can also search on your own through Psychology Today and you can narrow it down um, to see um, providers who accept your insurance. Um, most therapists with Medicaid and um, private insurance are um, offering teletherapy right now, so you can see a therapist during the pandemic. Um, that can be with um, video or just on the telephone. Um, and luckily in the United States, I believe, I yes, has they, we have mental health parity, which requires inter insurance companies to cover unlimited sessions with a therapist for a chronic condition. Um, that's similar to, you know, if you have diabetes, your insurance is gonna cover however many visits to the doctor you need to manage that condition. Um, so that would be similar for a chronic mental health condition such as bipolar disorder. Um, next, I'm gonna go through the crisis lines um, and some of these are specific to North Carolina, um, but all states have similar crisis lines and then I'll go over one crisis line that is um, a national provider. So the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and actually while I talk about this, I'm gonna pull up the number so you don't have to write it down while I am talking. So let me do that real quick and then I will read them off. Okay. Okay, that's good enough. So, first we have the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, they have many local chapters. So this hotline number is for um, the North Carolina chapter, but I'm sure if you were in Virginia and called it, they would certainly help you. Um, so that number is 1-800-451-9682. Next, we have the Hope for NC helpline, which connects North Carolinians to additional mental health and resiliency supports. That line actually just opened up again this week. Um, it was active for um, uh, individuals after the hurricanes. Um, but they closed it briefly, but now it's back open. Um, so that number is 1-855-587-3463. Next, we have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that, that is the national 
um, number that anyone in any state can call. Um, so if you or someone you know is considering um, taking their life, please call 1-800-273-8225. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a national network of local crisis centers that provide free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 seven, seven days a week. So I figured that people probably wonder what happens when they call um, one of these numbers. So I'm gonna let you know. Um, so when you first call, you'll likely hear an automated message um, asking you to uh, press a number based on um, what you're experiencing. Um, and then your call is routed to your local crisis network. Um, and if there is a wait time, um, there usually isn't. They'll play a little music while they connect you to a trained crisis worker. Then a crisis worker at your local center will answer the phone. And then this person will listen to you, understand how the problem is affecting you, provide you support, and get you the help you need. Um, and connect you to who you need to be talking to. So now I'm going to see if there's any questions. Okay, I don't see any questions, so we're just going to move on to the short visualization topic, or not topic, activity. Um, so I'm going to put those um, crisis numbers back up while I'm talking so it doesn't look like I'm just staring at you while I try to have you um, doing this activity. So I'd like you to pause, take a deep breath, place your feet flat on the floor, Really feel how your feet come in contact with the ground underneath you. Now place your hands on your stomach and take two to three deep breaths. Notice how your stomach is rising and falling with each in and out breath. When you feel comfortable, or if you want to, close your eyes. You may notice your mind is wandering and that's okay. Notice how your thoughts come and go. Now, as you keep breathing deeply into your stomach, I'd like you to breathe in for a count of four or five, whatever feels comfortable. Then hold your breath for a count of four or five. Breathe out slowly for a count of five and repeat. Let's breathe in two more times. Now I'd so like you to slowly bring your attention back to the room. Notice any sounds around you as you begin to open your eyes. How are you feeling after that short breathing exercise? Um, that was an example of a visualization activity. Um, there's many of those um, guided visualizations on YouTube if you found that helpful. Um, but thank you so much for joining me tonight. I hope you found this video helpful. 
please remember to take care of yourself and seek help when you need it.